following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. To um, begin, I want to offer to you a statement from our teacher, Samuel Anvior, something that he wrote in this book, Spiritual Power of Sound, which is quite a short book. It's small, and my expectation is that not many people have read it because it's one that not many people talk about, and it's also only recently available in English. But this book has a statement that, in my mind, stands out amongst the teachings that he gave. Even though he wrote however many books it is, 60, 70 books, and many thousands of lectures, and there are many millions of students, I think that the importance of this statement has been missed. So I would like to discuss it. So I invite you to listen very carefully to what's being expressed in this short sentence. And as I read it to you, I'd like for you students who are here on retreat to remember the state of consciousness that we've been working to understand, this expansive state, the state of consciousness that is not merely concerned with the personality and with the appearance that we give to others or with the sensation that we have of pleasure or pain, but instead an expansive awareness that's aware of our physicality, and it's aware of everything we see and hear and feel and think. This state of consciousness is the prerequisite to enter into this type of study. And so when we study this type of material, these writings, we should be studying from that perspective. These teachings, these writings given to the personality don't result in anything but problems. And most of us have experienced that by entering into groups and schools and places where everybody talks about the teachings, everyone pontificates about the teachings, but few know them. So this sentence for me, clarifies a very critical point of what Samael and Vior delivered to humanity. And as I mentioned, I feel and believe, based on my experience and my observation of the schools and students, that this point has been missed. So I would like to emphasize it today. He says simply this, it is completely impossible to experience the being, the innermost, the reality, without becoming true technical and scientific masters of that mysterious science called meditation. Very clear. But unfortunately, it seems that many Devoted followers of Samael and Vior believe that they can experience the being 
through other ways, through devotion, through imitation, through respect. But unfortunately, this statement is very explicit that to simply experience the being, our own being, we need to become technical and scientific masters of meditation. About this sentence, there can be no debate. It's expressly clear. A statement from a great master. A master that all of us have studied and have respect for and have veneration for and would like to follow his example. But all of that is not enough. All of that doesn't lead us to experience our being. We can memorize the teachings. We can have an encyclopedia in our brains of all the terms and philosophy. But that's meaningless if we cannot experience the being. And as he explained, the only way to experience the being is by really knowing what meditation is and knowing it with mastery. So that's why we're here. The retreats that we present and offer are for that purpose and that purpose alone. It's wonderful to have a community and to come together and have friends and meet together and share together. We need that. But it's not our purpose. Our purpose is to become like him, masters of the technique and the science. And mastery is not easy to achieve. It does not come from reading books or attending groups or by being involved with a certain teaching for a certain number of years. And it certainly doesn't come just because we know someone or we met somebody. There are many people who met Master Samael. That doesn't automatically make them masters or even smart. He met a lot of stupid people too. So we need to really be clear about the science and what it means. Our very soul is at stake. This is not a game. It's very serious. So what does it mean to meditate? What does it mean to understand Gnosis, to know what Gnosis is? In the previous lecture, we learned about the tree of life. As you know, in the Garden of Eden, there are two fundamental trees. There's the tree of life, which represents the Kabbalah, and it represents our spinal column represents the levels of being in us. So we study this image, which represents ourselves. And at first glance, it appears complex, but so do we. When we look at ourselves, we are quite complex. Even the greatest doctors and scientists on this planet do not understand even the physical body. And the physical body is only the shell. It's only the lowest part of these 10 sephiroth. We need to understand the rest if we wish to know what the being is. The being cannot be found merely in physicality. In the physical body, we can interact with physical things. And we can sense something of other dimensions, other levels. A simple example is that our thoughts are not physical. We sense them, we perceive them, but they aren't physical. It's the same with emotions. We sense them, we feel them, but they aren't physical. And the same with divinity. There are times when we can sense it, feel it, but can we do that at will? Can we do that all the time, anytime we need to? Can we feel and engage with the divine? For most people, no. And that's what's got to change. 
that lack of connection to the divine is precisely why this world has gone insane. So this tree of life is one of the pillars of the Gnostic tradition. Really any religion, because all religions are Gnosis. But the tree of life is just one side. The other side is the tree of knowledge, which in the Bible is called Da'at. And that means knowledge, gnosis. When we represent it as a graphic, we add a sphere right here between the top two triangles. And that sphere represents gnosis, knowledge, that mysterious tree in the book of Genesis, which is at the center of the entire Bible. Everything in the Bible happens because of the tree of knowledge, because of Adam and Eve and the, how they relate to the tree of knowledge. So when we apply that myth to ourselves, we can see it's the same. Everything in our lives is because of the tree of knowledge. Everything. Every atom, every thought, every moment that we experience is because of our relationship with the tree of knowledge. We want to change our experience of living, then we need to understand that tree and our relationship with it. The tree of knowledge has profound implications. It is a type of knowledge that is beyond the intellect. Simply put, there are many who study religion very devotedly and who, like many of us, work hard, study the doctrine, remember their teachings, even teach and help others to learn those teachings and work very devotedly for their whole lifetime to spread the knowledge that they love. Then they die and they're carried by karma to a new birth and they're born and they remember nothing. From that we know they had no knowledge, none. This knowledge of that real gnosis is never forgotten. It is known from birth. It is known in one's blood, in one's heart, in one's atoms. It is one's behavior, one's action, one's perspective. Genuine that Gnosis is never forgotten. It is how one sees. Maybe now you understand why we teach how we do on retreat. Not to teach you to repeat things, to memorize things, to believe things, rather to see them. To open your eyes not just physical eyes, conscious, to become aware. Truly aware. And not just with the image of things, but with the beingness of things. This is how one finds gnosis. Da'at. What that tree of knowledge truly is, it is a way of perceiving that transforms. So in the West, it was called alchemy. That term means chemistry of God. It's also called transmutation. This word means to change thoroughly. In the East, it's called Tantra. And this word means continuum, flow, thread. 
But that thread is the thread of beingness. So real gnosis, real knowledge, is not something in the intellect or in a book. It is here now. It is something that we experience through perception and through the transformation of perception. So in esoteric psychology, this is called transformation of impressions. And in many levels, is a transformation of all things. When we transform our way of seeing, when our consciousness is expanded and awake, that moment is transformed. Our beingness is transformed. And everything that we receive through the eyes, through the ears, through thoughts, through emotions, becomes a source of knowledge. Isn't it true? A source of knowing. A source of re experiencing reality. When that state of perception is deepened, expanded, strengthened, we can then begin to enter into the experience of the being, the innermost. Meditation, properly said, is simply a state of perception. But it is a state of perception in which we see something new. We experience reality. That's why, up to now on this retreat, we haven't really taught you meditation, even though that's what this is all about. We've been teaching you and preparing you, giving you preparatory exercises, training exercises. But meditation itself, something only you can provoke. It's a state of perception. It does not depend on sitting in a room with incense and a candle. It depends on being awake. The awakened state depends on nothing external, not a posture, not a master, not a book or a temple, not a holy city or a holy place. It depends on a state of being. In Sanskrit, that word for that state of being is bhava. Bhava means beingness, becoming. If you're really fully present, if you are severing the edge between before and future, then you are in a bhava, a state of becoming. And what is that becoming? It is kater. It is the first sephira on the tree of life. It is where the light of the Christ, the Ain Sof war, becomes. That is the being. That is in everyone. Not outside. Inside. So through purely working with expanded consciousness, one can experience that. But unfortunately for us, we've become so complicated so degenerated that we need to make a lot of modifications, a lot of changes to ourselves in order for that experience to become normal, to be restored back the way we once were as a primordial pure atom in the garden. In that state of being as that primordial atom, 
our consciousness had that ability to directly perceive God, talk with God, to know divinity, to know the reality, face to face, directly. We had that purity. But because of our curiosity about the tree of knowledge, we made a mistake, which we continue to make every day. We indulge in the tree of knowledge wrongly. Meaning, we indulge in our perceptions. We cultivate desire, attachment. We transform sensation and turn it into ego. This is how we continue to perpetuate the mistake. As the primordial Adam, we were in Eden, which is a Hebrew word that means bliss. We were in that blissful state. The equivalent word in Sanskrit is samadhi. Samadhi is a state of blissfulness, ecstasy, great beauty. It's an ecstasy of the soul. A soul that is directly in communication with the beauty of existence. A soul that is clean. But by abusing our perceptions, by becoming hypnotized by desire, we cultivated and developed pride, vanity, envy, and fear, and anger, and many thousands more. In synthesis, we created a sense of self that is separate from the being. We created an I, a me, which now we embrace and clutch and hold on to desperately, even though it's the cause of our suffering. On the tree of life, that I is here the lower realms, the hell realms. It is the reflection of the being. It is Satan, the devil, our own creation. It is how we took the light of the Ain Safor, the beingness, the becoming of Keter, Lucifer, and through our perception, we converted that light into the devil. We saw that light and became attached to the sensations of everything. We see the light in food. and We take that food and we eat it with attachment, with indulgence. And we turn that craving for that sensation of eating that food into gluttony into greed, into avarice, into laziness. And we see that light of Keter, of Lucifer, in that beautiful woman, in that attractive man, and we convert that light into lust, into jealousy, into envy, into me and that, into desire. And that from that conversion is created a devil inside of us. And then later, we see another person attractive. We see another plate of food attractive. We see an outfit, clothing, an education, a situation, a scenario, praise from others. All of those many things that we want to experience the sensations of and all the elements in us that we've already made clamor for more. 
We had that food at that place. Now let's go try that one too. We tasted that woman. Let's go try that woman too. We tasted that man. We tasted that experience. Let's try that experience too. So we add complication upon complication upon complication. And we've been doing it for lifetimes. Lifetimes. So through this whole process, we see a transmutation of light. An alchemical process that has happened because of a lack of knowledge. In Sanskrit, it is called avidya. Vidya means knowledge. Ah means without. It's often translated as ignorance. It means the same thing. The I indicates without. And after the I comes G-N-O, gnosis. Ignorus, ignoramus, as somehow on always says. We are ignoramuses, meaning those without gnosis. He's not talking about the students without the books, without the teaching, all those human beings that have not yet heard of the teaching. He's talking about those that have the books that think they have gnosis, but don't. The proof is in this. When you die, will you remember? When you awaken in the astral plane, do you remember to transform impressions? Are you doing that spontaneously? If not, then you don't know. When you awaken in the astral plane and you encounter a lustful situation, do you remember? Do you know what to do spontaneously? Are you transmuting your energy? Are you avoiding engaging in lust? The answer is no which means we don't know. Our access to Gnosis, our experience of Gnosis is superficial. It's intellectual. It's emotional because we believe in it. We love it, but it is not conscious. We have three brains, psychologically speaking. We have an intellect, which is where we store information, where we compare and analyze. We need that tool. When we begin to study these teachings, it's the first thing we need to use. We need to really understand how the teachings work and what they mean and what they embrace and what they don't. We have an emotional brain. And with the emotional brain, we believe or disbelieve. We accept and we reject. This is an emotional process, not logical. We also have an instinctive brain. And in this brain, we imitate. So we go to schools, we go to retreats, we go to church, and we see how the other people there behave and we learn to behave in the same way. We imitate. We learn how to sit, to stand, to walk, to talk. We learn the terms, the language. We learn the flavor. This is all instinctive, mechanical. It's in the motor center. It's in the instinctive center. Most students of religion stop there. We know a little bit of the teaching intellectually. We believe in the teaching emotionally. We are able to imitate the teaching with our bodies, with our faces, with our words. Most students of religion stop there. The one who will make it, who will liberate themselves, becomes cognizant of the teaching. They may not have everything memorized. They may not even believe in it, everything. They may not look like a student. They may be awkward. 
They may not meditate like the others, or walk like the others, or talk like the others, or dress like the others. But they are awakening. They're working with consciousness, not just the three brains. They are awakening. In this case, this student will remember. What they do consciously becomes a part of them. In other words, it is their beingness. It is their becoming. A student like this walks, talks, eats, sleeps, and lives a teaching from moment to moment in everything, transforming, questioning, looking, dying, letting go of the false notions about ourselves, abandoning pride, discarding vanity, disintegrating lust. In every experience, this type of student is seeking the knowledge of the moment. The gnosis that is vibrating in each instant. Samuel and Vior stated in the book, The Revolution of the Dialectic, precisely that. Gnosis is found in each instant. By the one who's looking. It is something that we live. That is what gnosis is, a way of perception. So that's why when we come on retreat, we work with perception. We work to expand how we see what we see, to learn to use our senses to the fullest because they are capable of far more than we know. But moreover, we learn to use them willfully, consciously to really take advantage of this beautiful vessel that we have, which is the physical body. It may not be beautiful in the terms of the materialistic world. The materialistic world may say that we don't have the characteristics of so-called beauty. But truthfully, we have a being within who is pure beauty. We are the human soul, whose name in Hebrew is Tifereth, which means beauty. And if we bring that soul here and now, and we look at the world and ourselves with the eyes of our soul, we are becoming beauty. We are becoming our soul. And this is how the soul begins its incarnation. Right now. Through perception. Rather than seeing our experience from moment to moment through the eyes of pride, or anger, or vanity, or fear, or lust, we start to train ourselves to see the world and ourselves through the eyes of God, through the eyes of our being, to look at ourselves in that way, expansive, seeing the big picture, seeing everything, not being distracted by details. This requires incredible effort in the beginning to train oneself to see this way. We call it self-observation. This term is interesting because it sounds like observing myself. And we talk about it that way. But if you think about it, it's really saying inner self observing. your innermost observing. And if you think of it that way, and you remember that, you will hesitate to act from anger, to act from lust, to act from pride, to say hurtful things. You will hesitate because you will remember 
my God is watching me. My God is here, my being, my divinity. How can I fall victim to my vanity, to my envy? How can I dirty myself when his presence is here? How can I make my temple filthy? This is the clue to transmutation, transformation, the knowledge of Da'at. Of course, that knowledge, Da'at, Tantra, alchemy, it encompasses the entire tree of life. It is a message, a teaching, a perception of how to transform energy on all levels. The root energy is that energy that creates life. The energy of becoming. And that energy first emerges out of the absolute as the Ain Sof War. And that energy modifies itself in order to create all existence in the form of the Elohim, God and goddess united in purity, in love. And in us, that energy is our sexual force. It is that potentiality of becoming. That energy can become and create a physical body easily. Everybody in the world knows how to do that. But that energy can also become the soul in us if we know how to use it. The use of that energy is not restricted to the bedroom. We're using that energy all the time, in every moment, in everything we do. When we receive an impression, and we're in a given circumstance, and we are experiencing being alive, in whatever level of nature, physical or otherwise, we are receiving information through our senses. That information flows into us and is reflected into our mind. That whole process of the reflection and transmission of images depends upon the sexual energy. Those who waste their sexual energy abusively go mad. They lose the power of imagination. They lose their creativity. They lose their ability to understand. Their minds become disequilibrated. Those who retain that force, work with that energy, transform that energy, their minds become beautiful, serene, expansive, and are able to reflect all of nature and that's why the wisest human beings were those who transmuted their sexual force and learned to meditate and were capable of reflecting back to us their beautiful knowledge about nature. It was this da'at, the transformation of light, energy, sex, that awakens the mind. It develops the soul. You cannot separate sexuality from psychology. You cannot separate psychology from religion. You can't separate religion from science. And you can't separate science from sex. They are all one. One knowledge. Dot. So, when we study this symbolism... We study it intellectually, like we study our own language. First, we learn the letters. We learn how to make words. We learn what each component means and how to use it. The same is true of this. We need to know that language in order to understand ourselves. But that alone isn't enough. We can easily with some effort, master the basics of Kabbalah. And there are many in the world who do. And we become capable of speaking about it very beautifully. 
and giving great wisdom and knowledge and explaining the tree of life. And this is lovely. But it doesn't liberate the soul. Liberation comes from experiencing all of these things. Not knowing them merely intellectually or emotionally or through imitation, but be, being able to experience them, to know them. We are here in Malkut, the lowest of the Sephiroth. Malkut represents our physicality, whether the world itself or our physical body. And yet we're scarcely aware of it. We forget we're in our bodies. On this retreat, we've done some work with the retrospection practice in which we recollect our experiences of the day. And all of us have experienced that when we try to remember everything that happened during the course of the day, there are enormous gaps in our memory. Times that we do not remember being in the body because we were not. We were not in the body. Somebody was, but it was not our beingness. This is the scary thing. Truly terrifying. When you realize you sitting here, listening, thinking you know who you are, try to remember back just a couple of hours and you can't remember what you were doing or where you were. Where were you? Who were you? Are you doing the same thing right now? Are you really aware of yourself, of being in the body? What is our beingness? What is our becoming, our brava, our state? We urgently need to answer this question. This is the beginning of learning to meditate. It's the very basic. Without it, there's no meditation. A master of meditation, a master, experiences the being, accesses the being, speaks to the being, perceives the being, doesn't think about it, doesn't have to make effort to remember God, knows God, sees God, experiences God, knows what that word God means, not intellectually or emotionally, but through experience. They live that. They are that. This is why those great masters, we call them gods. Because they are living that level of being. They have a bhava of a god. The beautiful thing, the amazing thing, is that any of us can do it. It's incomprehensible, but it's true. That is what we are. Embryos. Seeds. To become that. This becoming of Keter. That constant becoming. Is a seed in our sexual energy. That can become a god. You can call it a master, an angel, a diva. That is in us. And that seed is in the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So it all depends on how we deal with that tree of knowledge. What we become depends on that. And we establish that becoming here and now through our bhava, our state, our becoming. 
Another way to experience this in yourself and look at this in yourself is to understand that what is existing right now, everything that is perceptible right now, is only perceptible because you can perceive it. And you can perceive it because it is perceptible by you. And that perception is made possible by bhava, becoming. It is a constant becoming. It is an eternal now. Perceptible. The problem that we have is that we think with our mechanical perception, we are perceiving everything that can be perceived, and that is wrong. And all of us sense that it is wrong, and that's why we're attracted to spirituality. We are attracted to gnosis and religion because we sense somehow there is something more. There is something just at the boundary of our senses if we could just see it. If we could just perceive that and know God is real. The angels are real. Other dimensions are real. We want that. That's what drives us. It's what inspires us. It's what impels us. What is the being? What is a master? What is reality? We sense it. Because it's there. It is there. And to reach it, we have to expand perception. That means we have to change. If you remain as you are, you will see what you have seen. Simple as that. If you want to see what you have not seen, become what you are not. Become something new. You have to discard what you are. You have to break out of the shell. It is a shell that you have created. It is a shell called me. I. Myself. When we get our feelings hurt, when we get afraid, when we want security, when we want affection, when we want to be praised, we are in a cage. Those desires are cages for our beingness. When we're in the midst of our circumstances in life and we are suffering in pain, longing, wanting someone to save us, what we don't realize is that we put ourselves there and only we can get ourselves out. And the way to do it is simply to awaken, to pay attention, to open our eyes and see that what we think we've been seeing is a lie. That desire for praise, for acceptance, for that other person, for affection, for whatever we've been desiring is an illusion. It is a craving for a sensation. And when you analyze sensations, you realize they're nothing. Yet we continue to pursue them as though they mean something. What is the sensation of being praised? Have we questioned that? Really? When we are being praised, have we observed that sensation and seen it for what it is? Not to label it and say, oh, that's pride. That's fine. But that's not comprehension. That isn't understanding. That's not perception. Perception sees that the sensations of being praised are impermanent, unreliable, deceptive, and have nothing to do with the being, with reality. They are produced by some words 
we, re- we react to the words, we transform that impression to generate those sensations, and we feel them, and we love it, and then they go away, and we suffer again because we want more. This is the great deception of illusion, of desire. And this is true of anger and pride and lust and greed and envy and gluttony and laziness and all the rest. Every one of them is an illusion, unreal, made to appear real merely by our means of seeing. We're at our job and we want to stand above the rest and be the best one. Why? Who wants that? And why does it want that? Do we question? No. We merely pursue that. We have that ambition. We see that person. We want affection from them, attention from them. Why? Because we feel something lacking inside? Or do they have something so special that's better than God? better than the being? What is it that we're really lacking now, that we need these other things? Have we analyzed that? Have we really sat and observed what all of our interactions with others provide us and why we seek them out? Do we truly understand why we seek out the friends and relations that we have? Do we not yet realize that in most cases, we're simply trying to find people who will agree with the false sense of self that we've created? And they will say, yeah, you're right. That sense of self is nice. That sense of self you made is cool. I like it. Isn't that really why we do much of what we do? Dress a certain way, talk a certain way, listen to certain kinds of music, and appreciate certain types of culture because we want others to say that we accept you? Why do we need that? Why do we have so much falsity in everything we do? Why can we not simply be? Not one of these beings all around this building that we're in cares about that. Those cows don't care about impressing us. They really don't care what we think. They are simply contented being a cow. They're very happy. We are supposedly at a higher level than them. We are very unhappy. It seems to me they might be a little higher than us. They're just being. They're not complicated. They're not in conflict. They are taking the light of the eternal becoming and they are being. They are evolving. We are not. It's a stark, sad thing. But if we learn to be like that, to take the light of every instant and to be there to witness it in the body, present even if the circumstances are boring even in those boring moments of life when we really want to be entertained and distracted if we're really present we can really gain gnosis we can learn we can grow we don't need all the distractions that we surround ourselves with those really are food for the ego So all of this psychological content is what we need to study in ourselves from the point of view of an expanded kind of perception. This type of analysis that I'm recommending is not intellectual. It's perceptible. It's an analysis that one does by looking, not by thinking. It's by moving from circumstance to circumstance, being fully present and aware and really looking at what's going on. 
really seeing each other, really seeing and really learning how to be a human being. See, it's even in that word, a human being. We are not being. We are human doing. Always doing this and doing that and going here and going there, but we're never really there. And the proof of it is in our retrospection. When we recollect the events of the day and we can't remember where we are for hours at a time because we weren't even there. By establishing presence, continuity of beingness, we establish the foundation for meditation. To meditate is to see. That's all. It is to see, but to see reality. Reality is the being. The being is the tree of life. When one learns to be, in other words, to meditate, one sees the tree of life. Not in the intellect, with the eyes, with the heart, and with the body. One experiences the tree of life. This is a perception, not a concept. When you actually experience Malkut, you will realize how beautiful this world is and how incredible this body is, how precious it is, and how we really need to take care of it because we need it. This body is a beautiful gift from nature. It is the carrier of the embryo. It is the manger that God places the baby into for it to be born and grow. The baby is our consciousness. We shouldn't fill the manger with garbage, but we do. We shouldn't feed the baby trash, but we do. We go on the internet, we go on television, movies, radio, books, magazines, clubs, our friends out in the city, out here, out there, ingesting, transforming trash, pollution, poisoning the child in us, the soul. And we do it by choice. We do it because we like the distraction. We like the feelings. We like the sensations. We like to be accepted. We like to have fun. We like to enjoy the company of others. We like them to appreciate us. We like the pursuit of desire in all its forms. This is why we suffer. This is why we don't have gnosis. The one who really wants to know the being, experience the being, has to be a master of the technique and science of meditation. That technique and science begins by changing our way of perception. Firstly, being here and now, not just every once in a while, but all the time. Expanding our sense of awareness, not simply having attention that leaps from detail to detail, but an expanded awareness that sees those details while also remaining aware of everything else. This doesn't happen mechanically. It does not happen automatically. It is not a gift from nature. It must be learned. It would be beautiful if we learned that when we were children. It should be that way. To be taught how to use the consciousness. In the same way that we're toilet trained and taught how to use a fork. We should be taught how to see. But unfortunately, humanity doesn't know. But we can teach ourselves now. It's harder, but it can be done steadily, regularly, remembering oneself, remembering one's being, which is this, the tree of life. Remembering that one is alive, 
here and now, in the body, and observing, and watching, learning. Little by little, through that type of persistent transformation of energy, the consciousness expands, it grows. It's natural. If you get a job that is very physical in nature and you're moving heavy things constantly, naturally, you're going to grow muscles. You're going to get strong. The same is true with using consciousness. The more you use it, the stronger you get. And the stronger you get, the more you can handle. Like that, we keep growing. The amazing thing is, your physical muscles have a limit. There's a limit because of physics, what our physicality can do. But there is no limit on the consciousness. The consciousness is infinite because it is this, the tree of life. It is infinite into the depths and it is infinite into the heights. You can become whatever you want if you know how. Do you want to become a god? You can. Do you want to become a devil? A worse devil than you are now? That's really easy. All you have to do is follow along with society. They will teach you. Easy. Many are doing it. But to become an angel? Not easy. Meditation as a science, as an experience, is a way of perception. We learn many techniques that prepare us and train us for proper meditation, for that type of experience. And in the handbook we've provided to you, we've outlined fundamental principles of approaching the state of meditation. And that's what we're learning on retreat. Four basic principles that are present in every tradition of meditation with different names, with different structures, but the same essential principles. Relaxation. You can't meditate if you're tense. You can't perceive properly if you have tension. We should be relaxing ourselves constantly. Always aware of ourselves, always observing ourselves, always relaxing for many reasons. Firstly, it's more comfortable. Who wants to be tense all the time? It's unpleasant, yet we do it. Also, when you're relaxed, you save energy. For a muscle to be tense, it has to expend energy. When the muscle is relaxed, it does not. We need enormous energy to fuel the consciousness to awaken. And if we're wasting it simply by being tense all the time, it's sad. So we should relax. But especially when we're working with spiritual practices. Relaxation is a prerequisite for everything. This is what allows energy to move. But mostly, very importantly, it allows images to be reflected in us. Our physicality is represented in the Tree of Life here by Malkut. Physicality is, of course, this physical body that we have. It is the matter of the body. But the energy of the body, the vital energy that makes us alive, is represented by Yasod, the ninth sphere. Really, these two can be considered one. Yasod and Malkut. Yisod means the foundation, the foundation of life, the foundation of being as well, of becoming. The ninth sphere, Yisod, relates to the sexual organs. This is where, in us, all of our energies are most potent, concentrated. But Yisod also represents the vital body the body of energy, or chi. 
It is, if you feel now you have your physical body and you're sitting here, but if you really become aware of yourself deeply and you really expand your perception and you're very sensitive, you can feel the energy of the body. If you practice Tai Chi, Nei Gong, other types of exercises that work with energy, you learn to sense and feel the vital energy of the body and you learn to use it, to move it. Acupuncture deals with that energy. Acupuncture taps the meridians that are in the physical body that channel the energies of the vital body. So that's here now. That's what's allowing us to be alive. The vital body has four fundamental aspects. We call them ethers in the sense that they're like gases or vaporous aspects. But they're all really interdependent and intermingled with the physical body as well. Two of those are called reflecting and luminous. And essentially what they do is they give you the ability to see. Not merely physically, through all your senses, to see with your ears, your eyes, your touch, your taste, your smell. All of that is facilitated by the energies of the vital body. Of course, we have physical nerves, we have physical eyes, physical ears. But the energy that's moving through them is the energy of the vital body. That energy is semi-physical but it's really, it's full, uh, it's full uh, to see it fully is in the fourth dimension. When we see with the eyes, those images, that information is reflected by the vital body. That's what makes it possible. When you, for example, remember where you were before you came in this room, the images that appear in your mind are reflected by your vital body, by those ethers, the ethereal vapors there in that dimension. And they reflect those images into the brain. But if you think about it, if you really sit and think, if you try to imagine imagery, you don't really sense that imagery directly in your brain. It's kind of up here somewhere, but you can't really pinpoint it. But when you imagine, when you remember, let's say, Little Red Riding Hood and the stories of all that stuff, and you have those images, then it's sort of up here, but not contained in the skull, isn't it? It's sort of just above you. That's the vital body. So the vital body is not limited inside the physical body. It's an energy, a field. The point is, when your physical body is tense, afflicted, uncomfortable, that imagery cannot be reflected. So for example, if you're trying to meditate, you're trying to visualize, and you're trying to get out of your body to experience the higher levels of the being away from physicality, but you keep fidgeting and moving your body around, scratching and itching and moving and changing position, you're disturbing your vital body. Those images can't reflect clearly. It's as if you want to see a reflection in a lake and you keep throwing stones in the lake or hitting it with a stick. You're making waves. And thus what you see is confused, disjointed, uneven, unreliable. But when you sit with perfect stillness, the body, which is mostly water, sits, becomes very still. And likewise, the vital body, which is vaporous, also becomes very still. This is water also, but in the fourth dimension. In that context, that vital body can reflect anything. See where it lies at the base of the tree of life? It can reflect anything. 
This is in you. The vital body. How do we work with the vital body? Pranayama. Mantras. Runes. Rites of rejuvenation. Meditation postures. Breathing exercises. Meditation in stillness. When we do mantras, we do runes, we do transmutation practice, we are harnessing and activating prana. Pulling in prana from nature, pulling prana from our own yasad in the body, the sexual organs, and facilitating all of that to nourish, energize, and otherwise invigorate the vital body. And then we sit to meditate, we let it rest and become still. Now, so far, we're only talking about physical body and vital body. But when we meditate, we also need to be aware of our mood and our thoughts. Our mood or our emotions are related with the astral body, which is hod. Our thoughts are related with netzach, the mental body. This is in the fifth dimension, even more subtle. So we may be still physically, and thus the vital body is relaxed, but we may be very active emotionally and mentally. Isn't it true? Probably that's the way it is for most of us. If you've been here a few days, the body is becoming relaxed, we sit to meditate, and yet the mind is racing Thinking, thinking, thinking. Remember, going here, going there. Constantly active. This is here. Fifth dimension. Why is it like that? Why is the heart always surging with desires, longings, attachments? I need this. I need this. I need affection. I need to feel something. I need to feel secure. I don't have this. Or I feel so much joy. I'm so happy. I love everybody. It's always this swinging of emotions in the heart. We cannot meditate like that. This also must become serene like a lake. The heart and mind are like that because of how we're transforming impressions all day long. Because while we're walking around with our body and in circumstance and circumstance, we're taking in impressions, reacting to emotions, reacting to thoughts, and letting them run rampant. That's why we don't remember ourselves. That's why we have those gaps in our memory. We weren't in the body. We were in the mind. We weren't in the body. We were in the emotional body. <clears throat> Distracted. So we're in a conversation with someone and we're laughing. We're having a great time. It's so funny. I can't believe it. Loving that emotional state. No awareness at all of the body. Zero, maybe a little glimmer. But really, we're fully hypnotized by that emotional state. Or we're engaged in an intellectual conversation that's so interesting and compelling, it makes me wonder about so many things. Not aware of the body at all. Zero. Just speculating. Wondering, telling stories. And we meditate later, we can't remember any of that. Maybe a few concepts, maybe a little bit, but we don't remember where we were, who we were, what we were doing. And then when we're meditating, the mind is constantly with all of that. What about this? And what about that? And blah, 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 just constant. The emotional center is like that too. Something disturbed us or something excited us, and it's just surging and jumping from one thing to the next. All of that is because of how we transform impressions. Your state of being is always determined by how you transform impressions. Your bhava, your experience of being, is determined by how you transform impressions. Do you know how to transform impressions? You have to answer that yourself.
Learn. Know what that means. Understand what that means. This is why now you can see only those who are masters of the technique and science of meditation can experience the being. Where is the being? Being is the whole thing. But if we want to look for what we normally think of as our being, we have to start looking really above the fifth dimension. What we classically call the being, the innermost, the monad, is this triangle. Chesed, Gebra, Tiferet. These form soul, spirit. This is what we classically think of as God, our inner God, our inner being. To know that, to experience that, to see that is impossible when we are caged the way we are now. You can pray all you want. He's answering, but you can't hear him because your mind is too loud. Your heart is too chaotic. Your body is too disjointed, stressed, tense, ill. Let all of these become calm. Let all of these become still. Let all of them become servants of your transformation of life. And they will easily reflect the higher levels. Naturally, spontaneously, because that's what they were made to do. All of this here, we call the four bodies of sin. Astral body, mental body, vital body, physical body. Four bodies of sin, because these are the bodies that we use to abuse the tree of knowledge. With our mind, with our heart, with our energy, with our body. That energy primarily is sexual. When we wrongly transform impressions, when we are in the pursuit of desire, we are performing truly sexual abuse, abuse of sexual energy. The energy that keeps us alive, that nourishes all of this, is rooted here in Yasod, the foundation. <laughs> when we become identified with our pride, when our pride becomes hurt, and we become angry, that is an abuse of sex. Because that mistransformation of impressions creates an entity, an impression, resentment. And inside of that little bottle is the consciousness that was supposed to be awake, but wasn't. That impression was not transformed correctly. Instead, it became an aggregate, what's called a skanda, a samskara, an ego. And that's inside of us, down here. You see that? We think, we feel, we reflect it, through our sensations physically here, through the brain and heart and body, wrongly, it becomes an ego in hell. See how simple that is? Simple. Tree of life's not complicated. We're complicated. This is the subconsciousness, the unconsciousness. This is our ego, the hell realms. So what we need to learn is how to properly transform impressions. That's what we're learning on retreat. That begins by being here and now and questioning what we see, questioning what we feel, questioning what we think, not merely going along with everything that emerges inside of us, but learning to really observe it. What is this that I'm feeling? What is this that I'm thinking? And let me tell you something really shocking. You will find that almost everything you think and feel is completely wrong. Yet none of us get it. In the revolution of the dialectic, Samuel M. Vior said, 97% of human thoughts are harmful and negative. 
And yet all the Gnostics go around thinking they've got it all figured out. We don't have it figured out. Because we're going along thinking that what we think and what we feel is true. Is reliable when it is not. What is reliable is one thing. The being. Nothing else is reliable. Not me. Not this building. Not this country. Not even the planet. All of it will go away. No one knows when. No one knows how. But it will. Even this body will go away. The being will not. So it's better for us to get smart about this now. Learn to stop relying on things for our security and our pleasure and our entertainment. And learn instead to rely on the being inside. And learn to experience that. Learn to know it. Not just think about it, wonder about it, but know it. It is our purpose to be alive. To know the being. That's why we're here. All of this, which represents everything that exists, exists for you to know the being. And by know, knowledge, I mean that. To experience it from moment to moment. To be it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Oh, you have one? Okay. I was going to leave. I'm not sure I really follow the question. Can you try to rephrase it a little bit? It's not the English. I'm just trying to follow the concept. Yeah. Like music, meditation, mm -hmm. uh, but not emphasize doing uh, special concentration. Mm -hmm. So there are limits to what can cause meditation. You mean at home in practice or on retreat? So is your question, if we're not performing transmutation, is there a limit to what we can experience through meditation? Yes. Okay. So I did understand you. Yes. Very good. Yes, there's definitely a limit. If someone is learning meditation but does not know how to transform, to firstly restrain sexual energy, which means to not have the orgasm, but instead to restrain that force and transform it, if they are not doing that, in other words, if they are persisting with the orgasm, then the very energy that gives rise to the being here is depleted, wasted. That means that the seed of the being that can grow the soul and can grow a god or a master is not there. That means there is a definite limit on what that meditation practice can reach. That meditator can experience altered states of consciousness. That meditator with great effort can experience other dimensions. They can experience many things. They can develop powers because this is exactly what the black magicians do. They use the sexual energy negatively. They use the orgasm and they transform the energy of the orgasm into a source of magic. They feed the consciousness with that transformed energy, but it's polluted. And that's how they become black magicians, devils or demons in other words. But the extent of their power is limited, very limited. They are depleting their energy all the time, right? So in other words, they need energy. That's why they're always stealing it from everybody else. That's why they have so many tricky ways to steal energy in order to fuel their own desire 
that desire for power, the desire for sensations, whatever they happen to be chasing. So yes, there's a limit. You, you're dealing with a black magician or someone you think might be awakened? Okay, so in the physical world, you have to relate with someone that you think might be awakened negatively. Okay. First thing is to not be afraid. The chief tool that these entities will use is your fear, your lust, your anger, your pride. So if you're aware of that and you're able to maintain a state of equanimity, their ability to manipulate you is greatly reduced. This is the first thing. And so to really have that confidence and that lack of fear means you need to trust God. You need to have faith. Trust your being. Trust your divine mother. Pray to them to help you. Second thing is, if it's possible, limit your interactions with that person. If you know they're harmful, they're doing harmful things, then limit your interaction. You know, because we're weak, we have ego, and we're susceptible to being manipulated. So if it's possible, try not to interact with that person for your benefit and theirs. Because by doing what they're doing, they're creating karma for themselves and hurting others. So by separating yourself, you're trying to help them to not do bad things. Right? Thirdly, you should protect yourself. We have a number of books that explain many methods of protection, especially the book of the Divine Science which includes a book called Logos Mantra Theurgy. It's packed with prayers that are very effective at protecting oneself from these types of um, interferences. So simply that. In general, what we need to mostly learn is that there are a lot of people like that in the world, and we should not condemn them. We should not treat them badly. Because they're like us. They might change. So we should treat them like we would treat anyone. We have to treat them with respect. Treat them with kindness, but also with wisdom. So we have to be smart. Yeah. Any other questions? Wow, a lot now. Okay. Please. You talk of the fourth step and the third step and the two legs. What are the other three? The other three steps are outlined in the booklet that we gave. At the, for the retreat, so if you got one, uh, I have one here somewhere. Yeah, so in that booklet, we explained the four steps. The first is relaxation. The second is prayer. The third is concentration. And the fourth is imagination, visualization. So we've been talking about that throughout. And they're briefly outlined in that little pamphlet. There's another here. We'll get to everyone. What do you mean by that? Okay, I understand. Yes, people that have um, physical problems or limitations to the body. For example, they have uh, perhaps a karma from the past in which their sexual organs were damaged or became sick and had to be surgically altered. Um, in these types of cases, that person will definitely have a limitation on the energy that they have access to. Nonetheless, they have a being, they have a body, they have a chance to change. They can meditate, they can work, and they can accomplish a lot. But naturally, you know, depending on the degree of their ailment, the available energy to them will be less. But of significance in this point is, say, for example, someone has altered their physicality. Say there was an accident or a problem. I'm thinking of a person who had an internal illness, a, a difficulty with her ovaries, 
and one of them had to be removed. In some cases, two. But in her case, it was one. So she had it removed, and then it was a Gnostic student was very concerned. What was going to happen? How, what is this going to do to me? Naturally, it has an impact. But the key thing is, the root of that energy that she needs to work with is not in the physical body. It's internal. It's in the vital body. So she's still alive. She still has energy. She still can transform the energy that's available to her, and she can still work. There's a difference. But she's not dead. That makes a difference. Yeah? So as long as you're alive, you have physicality, even if you're a paraplegic. You lost all your arms and legs. You've lost everything. As long as you have a brain and a heart and a body, you can accomplish something. Use it. Comprehend. And through that type of attitude, really taking advantage of your circumstances, you can be granted a better chance in your next body. So we, from, from the perspective of the work to accomplish this, we try to look beyond the limitations of the physical body right now. It, it's going to die. It will die. You know, it's extremely rare for a person to accomplish the whole work with one physical body. It's, it's rare to the point of being unheard of. Most masters, even the great masters, worked through successive bodies to reach those heights, including Samuel and Vior. He had worked in his previous bodies to accomplish what he accomplished. He didn't do the whole work from beginning to end in one body. He had worked before. So we always have to bear that in mind. We all have problems. We all have limitations, some physical. Another question? To have that question always. Am I sure I'm doing this right? That's really it. It's to have that question. Yeah. It is, really. It sounds funny, but it's true. If you think you know, you're wrong already. It's true of everything in this type of teaching. And if you really, once you have years of experience in the teaching and you've worked with a lot of people and known a lot of people, you see it's true. The ones who really think they know are the ones that are most wrong. Because they've got a closed mind. And the ones who really do know are the ones who know they don't know. And those are the ones that are questioning. Right? Always questioning, always questioning, always thinking, I'm not sure. So I need to start from zero and try again. Start as a beginner every day. But work with perception. As though you don't know anything. You know, you don't know who you are. You don't know where you are. You don't know what this place is. I've never been here before. I don't know who any of you crazy people are. But I'm here and I need to perceive where I am. Absolutely. You start receiving them consciously. That is a transformation. That's right. That's where we stop translating and we start to transform. It's that questioning. It's perception. It's not an intellectual question. It's a question of perception. To look. I mean, really, what if we were on another planet? Would any of us realize it? Because we're all, time to eat now. We're just in our own little worlds up here. In our own little world, in our own little fantasy land in our heads. Not really seeing. When we go from room to room, we don't even see the room. Do you notice that? We come to the, when we, the first time we come in a place, we kind of look at it. We kind of look at it and say, oh, where am I? And then we scan it once and we build a mental picture and that's it. We don't look at it again. 
When we come back to that room, we don't see the room anymore. We see the mental picture that we first made. We don't notice anything anymore. And we do the same thing in dreaming, and that's why we're asleep. And it's especially why at home, we're the most asleep. Cats always see where they are. Everything to them is new. And babies, little babies, children, everything to them is new. Everything to them is astonishing. You see them every day, every hour, and they still look at you like, who are you? <laughs> they have that. We need that. We need that. That is the state that I'm trying to point at. It's a state of astonishment in which we look and we can't believe it. I mean, don't go around like that all the time because people will think you're nuts. Well, they already think you're nuts. They're just not saying it. They're being nice. But if you have that expression, they'll really, they'll start saying it. Oh, he's really gone over the edge now after that retreat. True. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Firstly, this state of perception that we're experimenting with and trying to develop does not evaporate thoughts. It does not make the mind come still. What we're describing is a state of perception that can then see the thoughts that are arising. That's what we need. So if you're seeing the thoughts, if you're aware of the thoughts and emotions, good. That's what we need. We need to become aware of what's happening. The stillness of the mind and heart comes eventually through comprehension, through relaxation. So as we develop that perception, what we need is precisely what you said. It's willpower. It's the willpower to remember from moment to moment. by building it like a muscle through all the practices that we do. Willpower is a aspect of consciousness. So when we talk about willpower on the tree of life, it's Tiferet. The human soul itself is the extension of the being into physicality. And that extension of the being is his will. So we are the reflection. We are the tip of the spear, the will of the being. And are we doing the will of the being? Is anyone here doing the will of the being? I don't know anyone who is yet physically. But to become that will is to become an incarnation of that. So that's a long work. That's stages of initiation that we have to pass through. But as we grow towards that, it's through using our will here and now to be present, to observe, to transform impressions. That grows willpower. To nourish that growth, to give it fuel and food, we use mantras, we use runes, we use prayers, and we meditate. And all of those grow the consciousness. They feed it. They aid it. They're all needed. And another tremendous support is the Eucharist. The bread and the wine. Take that every day if you can. If you have a place and a space and the time to do that. Do that little ritual. It's in the book, The Seven Words, and it's in the book, Torah and Kabbalah. And it's on the website also. We explain it in the sacraments of the Gnostic Church. That transubstantiation, which is a transmutation, gives the consciousness a lot of fuel, a lot of will to awaken. Question? Um, well, it's a personal thing. That's why. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's nothing really to teach about it. It's simply set it up and do it and
Yeah, we would need all the stuff to do that. So I don't know if we have it. Any other questions? That's right. And what's the way can the government take over when it's like interacting with a member or an aspect of the cluster and they force them to right. give in some way? Now, your question brings up a, a subtlety. What I've tried to describe for you here is a brief overview of our psyche and how to work with our psyche in spiritual practice, especially from moment to moment. The thing that is extremely difficult to do is even if you're making the effort to be here and now and to be present and to do this type of work, most of the time, especially in the beginning, we are still doing that through an ego. And to see that and know that is very difficult. To liberate oneself from the ego is not automatic. Just because you're paying attention does not mean you're seeing without the ego. The ego pays attention perfectly well because it has the consciousness inside of it. That's what it uses. When we are inflamed with anger, we pay attention very well to what made us angry. Isn't it true? When we feel lust, we pay attention very well to what stimulated the lust, right? Because the consciousness is trapped in that. The consciousness is our perception, our attention. So the ego manipulates that. So even though we're a Gnostic student and we're learning to pay attention and be here and now, that does not mean that we are perceiving without ego. Don't make that assumption. You have to question what you're perceiving. It's essential. And just assume that what you see is through the ego. This is safer. Assume that how you're seeing and what you're seeing is incorrect, is inaccurate, and that the ego is influencing your perception. Just assume that and know that you need to work in order to gain clear perception. On that note, let me explain what clear perception really is. Properly stated, True self-remembrance, true perception without ego, without any filter on the consciousness, where we truly see reality, is called samadhi. And it is an ecstasy. It is an experience of the soul out of the bottle, out of the ego. It is not anything like how we see now. You can have that experience in your physical body. It is not a sensation like a physical sensation. Some people claim samadhi is like having a bunch of orgasms all at the same time. That's a lie. Samadhi is a type of ecstasy of the soul. It is a kind of perception that has to be experienced to be understood. It is beyond conceptual explanation. But in synthesis, it is to see without ego, the way the cows see, the way the birds see, the way the plants are seeing. They are seeing nature as it is, without veils, without desire, pure, beautiful. If anyone who practices sincerely and makes effort in these types of studies and is constantly revising their practice, revising their perception, will reach that experience, and then you will understand. When you taste it, you will know. It is a kind of beautiful perception that penetrates the very core, the very essence of who you are. And when you taste that, you will say, that's it. That's what I should be. That is my real nature. So, good question. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between samadhi and the experience of being? Yes. You want me to explain that? Or 
Are you satisfied with that answer? Um, you can explain it if you feel like <laughs> Samadhi is simply the state of perception without any filter. So at any level of the tree of life, you can experience a samadhi. So here we are in the physical body. And if you are skilled in working with your consciousness and understanding the science of meditation, you can utilize the principles that we've explained. And through the combination of relaxation, prayer, concentration, and visualization, you can experience that perception. It doesn't depend on time. It doesn't depend on conditions or circumstances. It only depends on a state of being, a state of perception. So in that, you would see reality. Whatever that reality happens to be in that moment, in that place. That's simply samadhi. It is, in a sense, it's an experience of beingness because you're a part of the being. But to experience the being itself is something else. Because that experience that we described is simply in Malkut. If you performed the same act of attention and escaped the physical body, you could have that same perception in the fourth dimension in Yasod and see the beauty of that level of nature. That is also related to the being. You could have that same experience in the astral or mental worlds in the fifth dimension beautiful samadhi, also an experience of the being, but not the being itself. The being itself, the higher you go up the tree of life, the closer you get to the being of the being. And the closer you get to that, the less you become. This is where it gets tricky. This is where you require more and more skill and those principles. So, the experience of the being of the being, Keter, and beyond, is an experience that's incomprehensible to us. But it's accessed in the same way. You cannot experience that if you're in the ego. The ego cannot go there. It cannot see it. If you're here in the physical body meditating and you are in the shell of an ego, you cannot see the being. Because the ego and the being can never mix. He is holy. The ego is not. They simply cannot mix. This is why it's so essential to learn meditation. Because we are deeply trapped in the ego. The vast majority of what makes us a soul is trapped. And it takes great effort and the payment of enormous karma to escape that completely. In the meantime, we need to experience the being. So we need to learn to take the soul out, even if it's only for an instant, just to experience the being. And for that, the only way is meditation. So through these techniques, the principles that we've explained, we learn to do that. We relax the physical body. We relax the vital body. We relax the emotional body. We relax the mental body. In all of this, we are extracting the consciousness, which is here, Tiferet, willpower. What is willpower? Attention. What is concentration? Willpower. The will to pay attention to one thing. Concentration. That's this. But that concentration alone is not enough. There are many schools that work exclusively with concentration. They have beautiful experiences and they can accidentally experience the being, but they can't provoke it at will because they're missing one principle. The other pole, there are two poles. Imagination, willpower. When you combine these two, when they are harmonious with each other, the door of Samadhi opens easily. Imagination is related here to Gebra the divine soul. The divine soul is the container of chesed, the being. If we want to access the being, the light of the being shines through here, Gebra. And that light of Gebra is the light of our imagination. And we perceive that light through our will, 
through our mind and heart, through our vital body, reflected in the ethers, which then in turn are perceptible here, through the brain and the glands. Make sense? It's simple. It's simple. So if we are able to really harmonize that, we can experience our being. That's the difference. Sure. We're almost out of time, right? You guys must be tired. I really talk too much. I apologize. I have to work on that. From the being. The ability that he provides us of imagination. That is really starts to become visible here through the divine soul. Where we experience it from is here, physically. And that's through these glands, pineal and pituitary glands, and the brain. And those work because of the vital body. The vital body reflects the contents of what is above it. Heart, thought, will, consciousness, divine consciousness, the being. No, 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 no. The ego utilizes all of this for its own purposes. Imagination is a energy that flows down the tree of life. Everything here is images. Everything. When we study philosophy, we understand that all of this is mind. Condensations of mind. Which means that really... It's just images. When all of that finally arrives here in us and we have that light in ourselves, unfortunately, we mistransform that light. And instead of having conscious imagination that sees reality, we have fantasy. We daydream. So that same power that should be giving us wisdom and knowledge of the truth is what's giving us the garbage of our fantasies and our daydreams and the, all the things that we imagine. So we see the commercial on TV about how cool we'll be if we drink that alcohol and we imagine ourselves and all the girls flocking to us because we can drink more than anybody else. So stupid. But everybody falls for that because they're imagining how cool it would be. They're not even aware that they're imagining it. But it's that same power inverted. So the stuff that we, we can see is the, 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 the same garbage, but we just happen to be taking it seriously. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we need to know what is it we're taking seriously. So at the moment, we all acknowledge and stop our abandoned children as a mother and mother of ego. Many, yeah, of course we are. If we're not careful. And that's a great danger. And uh, it's a difficult problem. But we have no choice, really. We need to do the work. So while we're training, yeah, we're making more problems for ourselves. We make Gnostic egos. No doubt about it. We create a Gnostic personality. And unfortunately, many people stop there. They think just because they're in the teaching and they're learning the teaching and they do a little practice here and there, that, that is going to take them to the work and be done. And they get very proud of their Gnosticism, very attached to their Gnosticism. It's an ego. The being has no attachment to anything, not even to us. Yeah, till the end. Well, yeah, that's true. But at the end, you will see. Yeah. Well, I think that um, Jesus really when he said, you know, be in the world but not of the world. It means what we're explaining. We're here in the world in order to learn about the being. 
but we should not be of it, meaning we should not go along with it, become sucked into the illusions of the world. This, this illusory place is our training ground. We should not forget that. We need to utilize it, learn how to be a good person, learn how to act in the right way, but not become victim of the illusion. Anything else? Of course, yeah, everyone faces that problem. There's no doubt. Life is very challenging and difficult. Clearly, we have to take care of our responsibilities. It's necessary for us to be a good householder. We have to take care of our family and provide for those that depend on us. This is obviously an essential component to what we need to do. We also have a duty to humanity, right? To contribute to our community in the way that we are contributing, using our best skills in order to better the lives of others. But our chief duty is to God. Our chief responsibility is to our soul. So this is the conflict that we all face. This is the equation that we have to solve. Where are we going to place our emphasis? It's up to us. The being is watching. The being is giving us the opportunity. <clears throat> gives us the tools, gives us the circumstances. What are the circumstances? Ordeals. The being doesn't say, here's a lovely path through the flowers and it leads straight to me. The being says, here's a battlefield. And if you walk out there, you're going to die. But in that death, you will come to me. That's what the being says. But we don't like that. <laughs> we don't want to face that battle. The battle is ordeals. That's life. If we learn this shift of attitude to accept those ordeals and learn to transform them and let each challenge teach us how to be a better person, then we are doing the work. You may not have the time to do all the runes you want or to do all the practices that you want, but if you are transforming your experience, maintaining your chastity, maintaining your ethics, and transforming your experience of each ordeal, you are doing the work. And in the mix of that, serving humanity in your, according to your idiosyncrasy. So in each circumstances, you've got your work, you've got your family, you've got your situation, your house, you've got all the things to take care of. So transform that into service for humanity. We all have to work, right? Everyone has a job. And every, all the students are saying, I don't know how to serve humanity. What can I do to help people? I have this job, it's terrible. Turn your job into your service. When you go to work, go there from your heart to help those that you are there to help. Because all of us, whatever type of work we do, we are serving someone. Maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's the public. Transform that. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.
Yeah, I'm going